Hey everybody! This is our cells revision lecture. So I will talk through all the different cells concepts right from the very basics to the most difficult. All right, so obviously the very first thing to start with is what are cells again? So this is the good definition that we use. You can just call cells the basic unit of life, which means they're the building blocks that makes up every living organism. Okay, here's a picture of the first cells that people saw under the microscope. That was Robert Hooke who invented that original microscope back about uh, over 200 years ago. Okay, so cells make up all living things. The next thing is, well, some organisms are made up of just one cell and others are made up of lots of cells all combined together and working as a single organism. And so we call organisms that are made of one cell, um, these are called unicellular organisms. Obviously, uni means one. So these are things like bacteria and some protists and some fungi as well. But all bacteria are unicellular. Some protists, some fungi. So they're unicellular organisms, and because cells are so small, they are definitely microscopic. So any organism that's microscopic you can't see, you need a microscope to be able to see it. Um, so that's unicellular organisms, and multicellular organisms obviously are made up of more than one cell combined together and working together. Multiple cells living as a single organism. Living as a single or organism. Okay. And the groups of species that are multicellular obviously is us, so we're part of the animal kingdom. All animals are multicellular. And it's the same with plants. And then some of the fungi and some of the protists are multicellular as well. And we'll talk about the five kingdoms in a second. Protists and fungi. So it's the unicellular organisms that are the oldest. They evolved first. The very first organisms were unicellular. And then the ability to be multicellular, that evolved later on in the history of life. Okay, so here are those five kingdoms, and let's have a look at all of them, because this is how we classify every species. Remember that classification is a way for scientists to organise and to group lots of different species based on their features, and it helps us to um, learn how they evolved and how to talk about them um, as single groups. So the five kingdoms are Kingdom Animalia, which are the animals, Kingdom Plantae, which are the plants, Fungi, which obviously are fungi, and that includes mushrooms and moulds, everything else that we know as fungi, um, Kingdom Protista, which are things like plankton and algae, and then the Kingdom Monera, which is kind of the odd one out, as we'll talk about later, is which includes the bacteria. And let's look at some details. So the animal kingdom, kingdom animalia, just like we said before, all animals are multicellular. And the key thing that makes an animal an animal is they have to get their energy from other organisms by eating. As we know, we need to eat every day to get our energy because that's the only way we can get energy as an animal. Whereas plants, looking over there, they're multicellular, but plants are fascinating and amazing because they get their energy from the sun. They do photosynthesis, so they don't need to eat anything. They can just sit there in the sun, make their own energy, and it's all good. Sorry, not make their own energy, make their own food. Okay, fungi, as I've already mentioned, fungi can be single or multicellular. 
And the way they get their energy and food is by feeding on other organisms that are dead. So feeding on dead, um, dead organic matter or dead living things. And so the name we give that is that fungi are decomposers because they help to break down everything that dies in the ecosystem. They're really important in every single ecosystem, fungi. All right, Protista is the next kingdom. This is a random collection of lots of different types of species. Plankton and algae are the main ones. And the key with Protista is they all live in water. So they have to be living in some kind of water, watery environment. And like I said before, they can be single, they can be unicellular or multicellular um, as well. And then lastly, Monera, like I said, they're the odd one out because they are the bacteria and they have really simple cells which makes them prokaryotes and we'll talk about that later on. So they have prokaryotic cells. They're all multi they're all single celled, unicellular, which makes all bacteria microscopic as well. So always remember Monera is the odd kingdom out because they are prokaryotes. Every other kingdom we call eukaryotes. Okay, here's just another way of uh, picturing it. Plants, fungi, animals, and protista. They're all eukaryotes. Monera are on their own as the prokaryotes. In other words, they are prokaryotic and we are eukaryotic. All right, now we're zooming down into cells to learn about the main organelles. Remember that organelles, they are just tiny structures inside cells and they all do a specific function. They're like the tiny machines that you find inside cells. Okay, here they all are. Let's start at the outside. So the cell wall is the outermost layer of a cell. Um, it provides strength. So it keeps the, shell, the cell um, into one particular shape. It provides strength and shape to the cell. Really importantly, not in animals. Animals don't have a cell wall. but most other kingdoms of life do have a cell wall on their cells. Okay, then um, the next innermost uh, organelle is the cell membrane. That's what encloses all the inside organelles, the internal organelles. So it encloses all the organelles. It's like the plastic bag around the outside of the cell, it keeps everything together but it also controls what can go in and out. So it's like the border of a country as well. Controls the movement of substances, we can say. Controls the movement in and out. Some substances it lets in, some it doesn't, and then it lets out particular substances too. Okay, the next one as we get further into the cell is just the whole liquid part of the cell. And that's what this um, arrow is pointing to here. All of the light green area is just liquid that fills up the cell. And so that's the cytoplasm. It's the liquid part. It contains lots of different chemicals and it contains all the other organelles that are floating around in the middle there. Okay, well let's look at all these different organelles that are floating around. Definitely the most important one is the nucleus. That's like the brain or the control center of the cell. And as we learnt in the genetics unit, or as we will learn, uh, the nucleus, that's where all the DNA is. Packaged up into chromosomes and that's how the cell controls itself. 
All right. Um, these pink structures here, which I've got a zoomed in version um, here, are called mitochondria. You've probably all heard the phrase mitochondria, they're the powerhouse of the cell. But what that really means is that they're taking the food molecules that come into the cell from our digestive system, they're breaking those food molecules down and getting the energy out of it. So they're kind of like the power plant. Converting food to energy. Super important organelle. Um, the next one is chloroplasts or are chloroplasts. These are found in plants only. The big key being they're green and that's what, so it's chloroplasts that make plants green colored. And this is where photosynthesis happens. And if you can't remember photosynthesis, that's the process where plants are taking in sunlight and they're taking in carbon dioxide and they're using that to make their own food. Making food from sun and CO2, carbon dioxide. And they use water as well. Um, as you learn, we learn more detail about photosynthesis in the next couple of years. All right, two more. The tiny little black dots here, the smallest of all the organelles are called ribosomes. And these are the really important factories where proteins are made. So you can just call them protein factories. Proteins, remember, are the molecules that are basically doing everything in the cell. They make up other organelles, um, they do all the chemical reactions, they store things, they transport other chemicals. Proteins do everything. They're like the workers of the cell. Okay. And then the last one we've got are these small yellow circles and this large blue one. Together they're called vesicles. Vesicles are just separated areas that contain chemicals. So you can think of them like cardboard boxes. Vesicles are used to keep some chemicals in a certain place so that they're staying in the one place and not mixing with other chemicals that they're not supposed to. So they contain chemicals. Um, the small ones are called vesicles. The large one is only found in plants and it's called a vacuole. It's still a vesicle, it's just a really large one that plants have evolved to have in their big cells. All right, those are the main organelles. And what's actually happened as different species evolved is that animals, plants and fungi have evolved slightly different organelles in each of their cells. And it's really important to be able to compare them to see how these different kingdoms of life are different. Okay, well, let's look at the outside first. We've already mentioned animal cells don't have a cell wall. Whereas plants and fungi do both have a cell wall. You can see it's missing here in the animal cell. Always remember every cell, whether it's an animal or a plant, always has a cell membrane. Even plants and fungi, they've still got the cell membrane, it's just inside the cell wall. The other key thing I mentioned earlier is plants have chloroplasts. Animal cells and fungi don't. Some protists do, like algae. Uh, but we're not comparing protists at the moment, just these three. I also mentioned that plants are the one that have a large vacuole. Whereas animal cells, they've got the smaller vesicles, uh, which we just call vesicles. So that's pretty easy. You can see some here in this animal cell. 
And then this fungus has a few vesicles as well. Okay. And they're the main differences. So plants have most of the differences. Fungi have cell walls. Um, and that's really their only difference compared to animals. And animals, really, they've got the least number of organelles. We have the most boring cells. All right. Specialized cells is another small area to remember. So here's a whole lot of different specialized cells. We've got some muscles, some bone cells. Here are the cells that make up our skin, some red blood cells, and a nerve cell, which is called a neuron, as you learnt last year in Year 9. So specialized cells, they're just cells that have a specific job, and so they have a certain structure that helps them to do that job. Cells are with a specific structure and function. And really, every single cell is specialised to do a certain job. There's no cell in our body that's just a generic average cell. So, always remember that. We learn with basic biology by just looking at a general cell, but there's really no such thing. All cells are specialised. Okay, so we've talked about the main important organelles. These are a whole lot of other organelles that still perform useful jobs. And they're found in various specialised cells and across all the different kingdoms of life as well. Let's look again from the outside in. Um, this long tail organelle is called a flagellum. Flagella help a cell to move. So they're like a tail, they whip along, and they help push the cell along through a liquid. So sperm cells in humans, they're the only cells that have a flagellum, but lots of other protists and some other cells like plant cells have them too. Um, so they control movement of the cell. These things here on the outside of the cell are pretty much doing the same job of movement, and they're called cilia. So instead of one long tail that whips along like a snake, this is a whole lot of tiny, um, tiny little hands almost that swim the, the cell along. Just like hundreds of hands swimming through the water. So they control movement as well. Um, not many human cells have them. Although our windpipe has cilia, not to move the cell, but to move dust and things out of our lungs. So they can control movement of things outside the cell. They can push things along past the cell. All right, uh, next is some detail inside the nucleus. Right inside there is called the nucleolus. An annoyingly similar name to the nucleus. It is the really dark colored section that you can see in the middle. And that's where uh, ribosomes are actually made. So ribosomes are the factories that make proteins, or well, the nucleolus, that's the factory that makes the ribosomes themselves. And then once they're made in there, they head out of the nucleus through the tiny holes in the nucleus, which are called nuclear pores. And then the ribosomes head out to the cytoplasm to start producing proteins. All right, the next couple are all made of membranes folded and stacked on top of each other. So this set of membranes here, that's like a whole lot of tubes joined together, that's called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth ER for short, the, one of the best named organelles, endoplasmic Reticulum. 
Smooth ER is fine for our level at year 10. The smooth ER, well its job, it makes a whole lot of fats and oils for the cell. This is really important because every membrane in the cell is made of fats and oils, um, different types of those molecules. So cells couldn't exist without all those um, fat and oil molecules. So there's the smooth ER. There's another type of ER which is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And that's this one here, the dark blue one. You can see it's got tiny little brown dots all over it. And those dots are actually ribosomes stuck onto the membrane. So that's why we call it the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it looks like it's got a rough surface covered in those ribosomes. And as always, ribosomes make proteins. And these particular ribosomes, they make proteins ready to be exported out of the cell. So that's the job of the rough ER. It makes proteins to be exported because lots of cells need to actually make proteins and send them outside the cell to somewhere else in the body. For example, if you've got, if you're chewing your food, you need to make some saliva to start breaking down all that food. And so the cells in your salivary glands, they're going to be producing tons of salivary proteins and exporting them out of the cell. So those proteins would be made in the rough ER. Well, the organelle really closely related to the rough ER is called the Golgi apparatus, or the Golgi body. And this is like the post office, or the shipping centre, where the proteins go uh, just before they leave the cell. So the rough ER ships the proteins to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus labels them. It tells the cell, okay, here's where this protein needs to go. And it ships it off um, using a vesicle and sends it out. So it's, it's just like the post office and the shipping center. It puts labels on all, the, all those proteins that are ready to be exported out of the cell. Okay, the last couple are... You can see these long strands or long filaments. There's some purple ones there. There's a few gold ones here as well. These are all part of the cytoskeleton. And as the name suggests, this the cytoskeleton literally does the same job as our human skeleton. It holds the cell together, gives it structure. Um, it also helps some organelles to move, like railway tracks, if, because some organelles need to move to deliver things. So it provides structure and also allows some transport. Okay, the very last one is, so we can see some vesicles here. Um, some of the, some of the, the round organelles that look like vesicles, they've actually got grainy substances in them, like this one. This is a slightly different type of vesicle, it's called a lysosome. Lysosomes are essentially just a rubbish bin. Or a rubbish disposal. So, they take any old molecules or any old organelles, and it destroys them. It breaks them down using lots and lots of different proteins. Um, to break it all down, and the cell can reuse all of those parts again. Okay. That's all the organelles that you need to know. All the basic ones, plus all of these. So cells are really complex. It's amazing how much variety and how many different structures have evolved in cells um, over the billions of years. Okay, we're back to eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. So remember, Monera have prokaryotic cells. 
so we call them prokaryotes and all the other four kingdoms animals plants fungi and protists they are eukaryotes So the eukaryotes, they're easy to remember because that's what we've been learning so far. All the normal organelles, we've just learned about 15 or more. That's what eukaryotes have. So they have um, complex cells full of different organelles. Okay, except prokaryotes, like I said earlier, they evolved first. And so they have much more simple cells. They barely have any organelles at all. Remember when we're talking about prokaryotes, we're only talking about bacteria. For a billion years or more on Earth, the only living things were bacteria. So they evolved first, they're the most simple, um, and they have the fewest organelles. So what they do have is a cell wall. They still have a cell membrane. They can still have flagella to help them move around. They don't have a nucleus. So the DNA just floats around in the middle of the cell. We call it a nucleoid. It's just really just an area. It's not really an organelle. And um, they still need to make proteins. So they still have ribosomes as well. That's really important. There we go. Oh, and they can have cilia as well to help them move. So really, there's only five or six organelles that you find in a prokaryote. Really, really simple cells compared to eukaryotes, which are super complex. Um, and also, if we're thinking in terms of evolution, this can help you to remember all the different types, of all the five kingdoms. So prokaryotes evolved first, if we're drawing an evolutionary tree. They evolved first. Um, the protists evolved next, so they branch off the evolutionary tree next. Then the plants are least closely related to the other two. And then we have animals and fungi as the other two kingdoms. So animals are actually most closely related to fungi out of all the other two the other four kingdoms. Alrighty. The last main section to learn about is all about microscopes. So you need to know the parts of the microscope that we use at school, which are compound microscopes, and you need to know the different types of microscopes that are out there. So here are, the, here are the microscopes we used at school, pretty similar to them anyway. They're called compound microscopes because they have two different lenses in them. And so the two lenses combine their magnification uh, to increase how closely we can see into the cell. So the first um, lens is the eyepiece lens at the top here. Eyepiece lens. Remember, that's always times 10 on our school ones, times 10 magnification. And then the other uh, lenses that combine with the eyepiece are called the objective lenses down the bottom here. And they can be either times 4, times 10, or times 40. And they combine together with our times 10 eyepiece to give you total magnification and you multiply them together, remember? So our possible magnifications are 10 times 4, 10 times 10, which we say is times 100, and then 10 times 40, 
which we call times 400. All right, they're the most important parts, obviously. And the other sections that are useful are you need to know the stage, which is where you put your slide on to actually view your sample. There's also these metal clips here. They're the stage clips. That's where you um, put them on top so the slide doesn't slide anywhere. You've also got the basic frame at the back and the base at the bottom. Frame and base. The other really important part is the light because that is passing light through the cell and then through the objective lens up through the eyepiece into our eyes and that's how we actually see the cell with lots of detail. So you always need that light source for a compound microscope to work properly. Um, the last two are the focusing knobs. And remember the large one or the large section because in ours they're next to each other. They're part of the same, same switch basically. So the large one, that's called the coarse focus. That's for focusing broadly at the start when you're just looking at the sample. And then when you've generally focused using the coarse focus, then you switch to the fine focus knob and that um, finishes off the focus so you can get it looking really perfect and crisp when you look through it. Okay. Oh, the top section is also the head as well. All right. There are lots of different microscopes that scientists and engineers have created. So let's talk about these uh, and try and group them into categories to help us. So these first two here we call light microscopes. Pretty obviously because they use light to help us see the sample. So the two different types you have a dissecting microscope here um, and you have a compound microscope here. So we use compound ones at school. I think we have a set of light ones, of dissecting ones too. So compound microscope and the dissecting microscope, its other name is a stereo microscope, that's its proper name. All one word. Stereo because it's got two eyepieces which help you see a more 3D version of the cell than just looking through your single eyepiece in a compound. So the differences between the two light microscopes are pretty much just the magnification difference. The stereo one has a lot less magnification because it's only got a single lens up at the eyepieces. So lower magnification but it has a real open space at the bottom here, so you can actually do dissections live while you're looking through the microscope. So it's really useful um, in that way because you don't have to put your sample onto a slide to actually see it. And so that's the negative of compound microscope, requires a slide. But on the other hand, it can zoom in right up to about times 400. Better magnification. Um, and compound microscopes that you find in the laboratory, they can even get up to times a thousand, the, real, the more expensive ones. Stereo microscopes, really about 10, maybe up to 50 times. So those are light microscopes. Then you've got electron microscopes, which are a whole different ball game. Because they're not using light to pass through the sample and you're not actually looking at the sample directly with your eyes. The electrons, well, this microscope, it's firing electrons at the sample and then it's detecting those electrons 
using some sensors. And then it puts the image up on a computer screen and that's what we actually see at the end. So uh, obviously it uses electrons. It creates a computer image. And because it's using electrons, it can um, produce much finer detail and it can zoom much further in compared to any of the light microscopes that we've developed. The best electron microscopes are getting upwards of a million times or more. We can almost start to see individual atoms with our best electron microscopes at the moment, which is pretty amazing. All right, and now let's have a look at some pictures of organelles under electron microscopes. So whenever you see these black and white images, you always want to be thinking these are electron, electron microscope pictures. All righty. The key thing is you need to look out for some of the main organelles that look similar. And let's have a look at the key differences you want to keep an eye out for. So the Golgi apparatus, which is like the post office, it's packaging proteins and sending them out of the cell. The thing you want to look for is a big stack of organelles all on top of each other. Basically like a stack of pancakes. Sorry, not organelles, stacked membranes. And you've also got lots of vesicles around the outside of it because they're carrying the proteins outside the cell. So that's the key to look for when you're identifying the Golgi apparatus. The difference between a chloroplast and a mitochondria is really difficult. The key thing to look for here though, well, if it's been colored in, the easy thing is chloroplasts are green. If they're black and white like this though, you want to be looking for the membranes inside it. And what you can picture with the chloroplast is it's basically like a whole lot of stacked membranes kind of like a whole lot of coins or pancakes on top of each other. Um, so stacked circular membranes. And these little membranes, that's actually what's capturing the light of the sun so that photosynthesis can happen right in there. And mitochondria also have membranes on the inside but have a look closely, they're more like finger shapes pointing in from the outside membrane of the organelle. So that's the key to look for when you're identifying mitochondria. You've got finger-like membranes. Okay, then you've got the endoplasmic reticulum. Remember there are two types. This one here you can see has lots and lots of small ribosomes attached to it. And as soon as you see ribosomes attached, definitely that's the rough ER. The rough endoplasmic reticulum. So if you can see ribosomes, and if you can see a whole lot of layers of membrane, like a maze basically, that's the giveaway that it's an ER an endoplasmic reticulum. So once you know that it's an endoplasmic reticulum, if it's got the ribosomes, it's rough. But if it just looks like a smooth maze of lots of membranes all um, sort of joining in and out of each other, that's going to be the smooth ER because there's no ribosomes on it. All right, the last thing is here are some cells, entire cells now. Let's see what we can identify within these using our um, knowledge of the organelles. So here we've got an, an animal cell with an electron micrograph, which just means a picture from an electron micrograph. This huge circle here, that is just the nucleus. The dark circle is always the nucleus. And in a really dark circle in the middle, that's going to be going to have to be the nucleolus. 
we can see a cell membrane on the outside. Every cell has one. And because it's an animal cell, we know there's no cell wall. Um, I can see lots and lots of thin membranes snaking all through this cell. And I can see closely they are dotted with little black dots. So all these membranes are the rough ER. There must be cytoplasm in between that, that's the grey section. And I can see some oval shaped organelles here and you can kind of see fingers, finger like membranes. So that's a mitochondrion. Remember mitochondrion is the singular. And another mitochondrion over here. And then I can see some small circular organelles. They're going to be vesicles just carrying various chemicals. Oh, they could be lysosomes as well. It's too hard to tell in this one. Okay, that's all that I can see there. Let's go across to the plant cell now. So we're looking for a large circle that contains a dark circle inside it. Well, that's here. So that is the nucleus with the nucleolus in it. So nucleus, sorry, nucleus and nucleolus. Um, there is a gray area, which is the liquid. So that's just the cytoplasm. And in a plant, we're always looking for that large vacuole. So here it is here, a large liquid filled vesicle. That's just storing a whole lot of chemicals for that cell. So that's the vacuole. These long dark things, well, they're huge chloroplasts because you can see inside it, you can see the stacks of membranes. So there are chloroplasts. What else can we see? There are some smaller, really small ovals. They're going to be the mitochondria for this plant cell. And that's about it. Ribosomes would be there, but we can't see any. We need to zoom in for that one. Okay. So that's an example of how you can identify lots of different organelles uh, based on some microscope pictures. Okay, that is basically everything you need to know about cells. Good luck revising.